Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this um, tremendous conference. Today, I'll be talking about sensory systems in autism, and my primary focus is going to be on the somato sensory systems. I'll first provide a brief overview of the sensory challenges that are seen in autistic individuals, and then I'll briefly discuss the development of the sensory systems and their roles in uh, child development. I'll next focus on the somato sensory system and provide some evidence to support a causal role for tactile dysfunction in the core features of autism. And then finally, I'll discuss uh, current treatments and gaps in our knowledge. Now, although uh, sensory differences have long been recognized to be common in autism and uh, was first noted in the descriptions by Leo Kanner and Hans Aspergers, it was not until 2013 that it was formally recognized in the DSM-5 as one of the core features of autism where individuals are described as either being hypo or hyper reactive to sensory input, or they may have unusual interest in the sensory aspects of the environment. It is estimated that about uh, 69 to 93% of children and adults with autism have uh, sensory differences. Some of the common complaints that I have heard are sound hurts my ears or light hurts my eyes. It's not uncommon that parents report that their child doesn't notice pain. And I've heard parents say, I, I didn't notice that he fractured his arm because he never cried and he never uh, attempted to protect it. Other parents share that their child engages in self-interest behaviors such as poking at their eyes, banging their uh, heads or they're punching their forearms. And this can lead to significant trauma. Unusual sensory exploration may take many forms. Some are noted to closely inspect um, objects. Others may look at objects out of the corner of their eyes and others have an aversion to typical everyday sounds or they may lick non-food objects. The age at which uh, sensory symptoms emerge and their developmental trajectory has become a focus of many debates and there is notable uh, heterogeneity in the severity of the sensory behaviors the age of onset and their stability over time. And some parents report uh, that one behavior replaces another. Now in the study of 332 children and adults with ASD, Tillman and colleagues parsed them into three groups. You have those who have a low, moderate and a high severity of sensory differences. You can see that um, those with auditory filtering or abnormalities in auditory filtering rather are present in all three groups, while um, abnormalities in movement and sensitivity is only present in uh, those who are moderately or severely um, impacted. It's the severity of these sensory symptoms that are thought to be tightly associated with poor adaptive skills and behavioral challenges. And it's for this and other reasons why the study of our senses have um, been the focus of research for quite some time. In the 17th century, Rene Descartes is reported to have posited that our senses are fallible and our perception is based on inference. And then about a century later, Immanuel Kant um, is noted to have said that all knowledge begins with the senses, proceed then to the understanding and ends with reason. There is nothing higher than reason. So questions regarding the role of senses in the maturation of the individual has been the major focus of research and the relationship between sensory differences and social and behavioral challenges have been a focus of research in the last uh, two decades. A major challenge, however, has been our understanding of the cause and effect relationship between sensory challenges and higher cognitive and behavioral function. To begin that conversation, I want us to think a little bit about how our senses develop. The anatomical structures of our senses develop in utero, uh, first starting with our sense of touch. It's followed by taste and smell, auditory, and finally vision uh, continues to, uh, the anatomical structures for vision continue to be formed in the postnatal period, so after birth. 
Interestingly, as the anatomy is uh, laid down, its functional, functional response uh, begins to emerge and touch is the earliest to develop. So somatosensory responses can be de detected as early as eight weeks in utero. And movements in the fetal, preterm, and newborn period has been shown to be modifiable by sensory inputs. In fact, both preterm and term infants are known to move to tactile stimuli. Now at birth, the infant is exposed to a variety of new sensory information, which places a demand on them that they need to both perceive and adapt to this um, new information. And the new sensory information is critical for them to be able to learn how to interact with their physical environment. Touch is a primary mode of communication between babies and caregivers, and it's utilized even prior to the development of verbal language. A prime example here is the rooting reflex, uh, when the neonate turns to a perioral tactile stimulus and initiates the sucking reflex, which you'll see in this uh, little video clip. Infants also in the first month of life, they use their fingers to explore novel sensory stimulus that is placed in their hands. And this ability develops even before visual attention and reaching skills uh, come online. So as development progresses, refinement of the individual sense, senses occur, and this later is followed by the emergence of um, multisensory neurons that develop the capacity to integrate information from different sensory modalities. And this ability becomes very useful when we are in um, environments that are very sensory stimulating. So if you were to walk through the subway station in New York, you'd be bombarded with a variety of sensory information, um, all coming at you from numerous external sources. These are processed through different sensory systems. And despite the complexity of the sensory information, our brains are able to determine which pieces of sensory information originated from the same source and is able to integrate this into a complete coherent representation. The example I'd like to use is that of the train horn, the headlights, and breeze coming from the tunnel. This tells us that the train is entering the station, thus allowing us to respond optimally by moving away from the edge of the platform. Now, similarly, we'd be able to dissociate sensory information originating from different sensory sources, thus segregating them into different constructs. It is this ability to synthesize diverse sensory information that is known as multi-sensory integration, and it relies on exposure to a diverse array of sensory stimuli. Several studies suggest that when children are confronted uh, with different sources of sensory information, they utilize this process called unisensory dominance, whereby they make judgments based on only one of their senses, and usually it's the most dominant sense. And the process of integration of the senses occur over time and is refined and is thought to reach maturity in a late adolescent. Now, multi-sensory integration depends on alignment of sensory information. And there are different uh, perceptual and behavioral domains that can be impacted when there is misalignment. For example, we can think about speech development. So our ability to understand and develop language is enhanced when the sound is paired with congruent facial expressions. And the combined use of information from multiple senses have been shown to enhance object identification, recognition, and recall, suggesting then that multi-sensory integration can serve as a scaffold for the development of higher order skills. This concept is supported by a growing body of evidence of impairments in audiovisual, audio tactile, and visuohaptic integration in individuals with autism, neurodevelopmental disabilities, and other neurogenic conditions. We also see atypical features um, that uh, have been linked to uh, atypical sensory features, rather, that have been linked to both repetitive, restricted behaviors, anxiety, behavioral problems, social communication deficits, 
sleep difficulties, and adaptive functioning. So how do we get from the atypical sensory processing to problems of higher brain level uh, function? I'd like to take us back to touch. Um, remember, it's the first of our senses to functionally respond to stimuli. And I particularly like this quote from Vladimir Nabokov, and he says, it is strange that the tactile sense, which is so infinitely less precious to men than sight, becomes at critical moments or main, if not only handled to reality. And this statement reminds me that touch is central to who we are. We can lose sight and hearing, and we could still navigate our environments. But this becomes significantly difficult, more difficult if we were to uh, lose our ability to experience or respond to tactile stimulus. Our sense of touch endows us with the ability to navigate and develop constructs of our environment. And studies in human and non-human primates have shown that early maternal touch is important for pro-social development and that maternal touch communicates a series of emotions, including love, care, sympathy, empathy, and security, among others. In a study of 39 mothers and their four to six-year-old children, recent colleagues uh, showed that children were more likely to attend to social information if they were touched, while maternal localization had no effect on their attention to social information. We also know from uh, children in Romanian institutions that deprivation of early touch in humans have been linked to later cognitive and neurodevelopmental uh, delays. And in the study from uh, Wade et al, they showed that uh, children reared in Romanian institutions had more social deficits compared to those who were removed from the institutions and placed in foster care within the first two years of life. And overall, children who spent time in an institution had more social and communication difficulties when compared to those who were never institutionalized. So together, these data points to the centrality of touch and begs the question, what happens if we are exposed to touch but have difficulty processing it? Now, this is evident in individuals with autism and other NDDs where disruption in somatosensory processing is observed. Early biographical accounts from Temple Grandin and Gerland indicates that hugs and light touch can be overwhelming. Temple describes small itches and scratches that other people ignore to be torture. And Gerland said that being lightly touched made her feel as if her nerve endings were curling up. She used the term, I simply died, or that's what it felt like. So we process touch through both our peripheral and central nervous system. And it begins with activation of a diverse group of highly specialized neurons in the skin. The information then goes uh, to the spinal synapses, to the thalamus, and then to the somatosensory cortex in the brain. The somatosensory cortex has strong connections to multiple brain regions that are crucial for social, emotional, and cognitive processes. And uh, clinical and preclinical research in ASD have historically focused on the brain. However, work from David Ginty's group showed a compelling argument uh, using four um, uh, rodent models of autism that autism-related challenges can be causally linked to dysfunction in the peripheral nervous system. They use a text texture specific novel object recognition task and their team probed for differences in touch sensitivity uh, between both wild type mice and um, models of autism. And they found that tactile discrimination and hypersensitivity to uh, gentle tactile stimulus was present in all four strains of mice uh, carrying mutations in either fMR1 MECP2, Shank3, or GABRB3 genes. They also showed that deletion of MECP2 from the spinal cord or the dorsal root ganglia was sufficient to um, cause abnormal touch, deficits in uh, social engagement, and anxiety. 
However, uh, deletions in the forebrain only um, did not exhibit any of these deficits. These findings in the rodent models are uh, pretty consistent with the results of um, somatosensory ERP studies that show both brain and spinal cord impairments uh, in girls with Rett syndrome. And the find findings of a typical uh, somatosensory processing is also seen in the mouse model of SYNGAP1, which is another genetic uh, cause of autism ID and epilepsy. Now work from Gavin Rumbaugh's group show that haploid insufficiency of SYNGAP1 uh, leads to early functional maturation of excitatory synapses in the neocortex, and that the early maturation influences the duration of the critical period, which they map to postnatal day seven through 21. They also showed that SYNGAP1 mice have deficits in tactile sensory processing in the somatosensory cortex, which um, is, is due to uh, limitations in the ability to encode information related to touch. In addition to its role in the brain, SYNGAP1 is also shown to play important roles in the, um, in the perception of pain in the per peripheral nervous system where it regulates capsaicin-induced uh, sensitization. SYNGAP1 uh, is a newly characterized genetic disorder. Uh, it, we think that there are approximately 600 individuals diagnosed worldwide, and the pathogenic variants in SYNGAP1 is estimated to account for 2 to 8 percent of sporadic ID and about 1 percent of epileptic encephalopathy. About 50% of individuals with SYNGAP1 have been diagnosed with autism, and about 70% have been diagnosed or, or reported, rather, to exhibit uh, severe behavioral problems or high pain threshold. We also note um, that there is delays both in language and fine and gross motor uh, skills, which are common in individuals with SYNGAP1. Um, they uh, generally develop first words on average by three years old. They may walk on average by 20 months old and fine motor uh, skills are generally acquired after three years old. Epilepsy is also a common feature and is an indicator of um, circuit level dysfunction and the hyper excitable states and that's uh, uh, consistent with um, findings from Gavin Rumbaugh's group. Now, given the high pain tolerance, we sought to examine the sensory profile of children with SYNGAP1, and we showed that as a group, their sensory profile is more exaggerated uh, when compared to typical developed peers. So all individuals had a high sensory, uh, sensory threshold, and they were slow to register sensory stimuli, while some had a mixed sensory profile that included seeking, um, avoidance and sensitive patterns of response. More than 50% had an atypical response to touch, movement, and body positions, which are all part of the somatosensory assistance. Now, since children with SYNGAP1 often have uh, behavioral problems, we hypothesize that these behavioral problems were correlated with their sensory profile. So we set out to characterize the problem behaviors and then look for correlates with uh, their sensory profile. And we used a functional analysis approach where we asked, what is the behavior and why do they occur? So what is the function of the behavior? We were able to elicit several problem behaviors uh, with the more common ones being elopement, self-interest behavior and repetitive uh, restricted behaviors. Some problem behaviors had more than one function but in general, they were maintained by automatic reinforcement uh, in most individuals. And then about 60% of participants um, had uh, attention to and uh, access to tangibles as uh, their primary function for their uh, maladaptive behaviors. We next looked at the sensory profile of the three most um, common problem behaviors. And at first glance, uh, we see that the sensory profile for each cohort is very different and that the sensory profile for the SIV cohort is more dysregulated um, when compared to those uh, who engage in repetitive behaviors or elopement. 
we also see that there's a strong positive correlation between seeking behaviors and touch um, and uh, as compared to uh, the repetitive and the elopement group. And there is also uh, a typical uh, response to um, uh, movement and uh, visual, uh, visual uh, sensory systems uh, in those who elope, um, but a typical response to auditory and visual systems to those who uh, engage in repetitive behaviors. Now, these findings are um, essentially consistent with the idea that individuals who are more sensorily dysregulated have more behavioral and adaptive uh, challenges. In summary, um, I've shown you that uh, atypical sensory response is common in ASD and other NDDs. It occurs across all sensory domains. I've shown you that tactile sense is the first to develop and is important for pro-social development. And that the tactile sense is thought to be a scaffold for the development of multi-sensory integration, whose function is strongly linked to cognition, language, communication, and social behavior. I've also shown you that alterations in somatosensory circuits leads to ASD phenotype and genetic models of ASD, and that similar tactile phenotypes are noted in, in humans with corresponding genetic disorders. We see that uh, the peripheral nervous system is uh, plays a role in um, not only the somatosensory dysfunction, but also some of the behavioral phenotypes that we attribute to uh, autism. And so we can now expand the functional locus to include both or a uh, sensory nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. And then finally, I showed you that there is strong correlation between abnormal processing of tactile stimuli and seeking behaviors in individuals with SIB and that those who engage in SIB are more dysregulated across all sensory domains. So where do we go from here? How do we use this information? What are some of the current treatments and how effective are they? Sensory in integration and sensory processing treatments are commonly used to target uh, challenges and the protocols are designed to enhance sensory experience with the goal of uh, subsequently improving behavioral outcomes. Now, although these treatments are commonly used both in private practice and in school-based systems, there is limited but emerging evidence to support their effectiveness. And there's been several case reports and small studies um, that uh, show varied response to uh, sensory integration or sensory processing treatments, and there've been limited um, randomized control trials. Some that show improvement, um, show improvement in the targeted system within six months of treatment without any benefit to uh, language and social skills. And in a review of about 25 um, studies, three were found to be beneficial, eight had mixed results, and 14 showed no benefits. Now it's thought that the mixed picture um, results from uh, either a small sample size or the approach uh, to the study. Now, naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions, NDBI, is another approach to treat um, behavioral uh, challenges. However, it primarily targets behaviors without directly targeting uh, sensory differences. It has a strong evidence base with moderate to large effect size for improving ASD symptoms. And some have suggested that um, there might be some utility in using behavioral framework uh, to examine uh, sensory um, integration or sensory processing treatments. So where does multi-sensory integration fit into all of this? Several groups have developed effective measures for characterizing multi-sensory integration, both in preclinical and clinical research. And some of these studies have focused on children with, with autism, but they have yet to, we have yet to see how uh, they are translated to the clinic and whether or not they could be used to predict outcomes. But to, to do that, we would need to um, have standardized norm reference measures of multi-sensory processing that are not time or cost prohibitive and that can be used in young and in those with cognitive and communication challenges. 
Now, despite the strong conceptual link between uh, sensory processing and multi-sensory integration, there's been no systematic studies looking at the effect of uh, sensory-based treatments on multi-sensory integration. So in the last two slides, I just want to touch a little bit on this um, treatment implication from some of the preclinical work from David Ginty's group, where they show that they were able to attenuate tactile overreactivity um, when they acutely administered uh, peripherally restricted GABA-A receptor ag agonist. And in the, in the MECP2 or SHANK3 um, rodent models, when they chronically administered this agent beginning in the neonatal period, they found improvements in anxiety and social behaviors. So this suggests that treat, targeting um, the peripheral somatosensory system may improve social and behavioral phenotypes in ASD. And brings me to my final slide, which is that uh, I can envision a future where evidence-based treatments not only target the central nervous system, but also the peripheral nervous system and incorporates uh, sensory integration and multi-sensory multi -sensory, uh, processes. So with that, I'd like to stop here and acknowledge um, members of my team. Uh, the functional analysis work were done by Griffin Rooker and Michael Krennic. I have a question about touch, uh, particularly. Let me just throw that in to begin with. One of the last meet, one of the meetings I did for the the centre I have here at UCSD called the Collaboratory, was we did a meeting in a live auditorium, um, and it was on loneliness. And we talked about solitude, and I was arguing that we have lost touch. People don't even general audit just don't touch anymore. They're just something very strange about uh, the distancing that was happening. I noticed that I walk every day and I noticed it, but uh, people just keeping their distance. Then, so then people have said, yes, we all feel lonely. Let's get some guests to get, get together and have some um, loneliness dinners. And then uh, 10 days later, the pandemic hit and boom. So there we go. Um, but that, that sense of, what, what, could you tell me more about the whole notion of tuss, touch, in uh, in this in the in in a neurodiverse population, I mean, is that is it is there a range of responses? Do people on that in the spectrum tend to want to keep distant? Just for a general population here who don't know this, what's what's the response to in terms of touch? Yeah, so I think that um, there is a, a range of responses. Um, that is seen not just in uh, the autism or NDD population, but also in the quote unquote typical developed population. Even if we were to focus primarily on the NDD and autism population, there are some who desire pressure and others who cringe when you touch them lightly or you administer pressure. Um, so I, I, I think that there is a variability and heterogeneity in touch similar to the degree of variability and heterogeneity that we see in other symptoms um, or features of ASD, whether it be uh, social abilities or um, you know, sensitivities to other modalities. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, before I come to you, Bradley, uh, there was a, there were, uh, both of you, in fact, there was a question that Rich Horner sent in at 12.29, just as we were breaking for lunch. So I suppose it's referring to the first three speakers this morning. However, it does seem not inappropriate to raise it at this point as well, especially with the Institute you're running and so on. Rich said, with this kind of data that's available, why do you think there's such a disconnect with our healthcare model on the link linkages between autism, seizures, and other neurological challenges. Seems like the treatment process approach is decades behind where it should be. I mean, this is something you must be deal with as well. Or uh, Connie, Connie, I, I'll just comment really quickly. I, I, think, I think that I, I agree with the, the, the basis of the question. And one of the reasons why we, we I think at Kennedy Krieger, uh, feel like we are bridge, bridging that gap is that we take a, a truly multidisciplinary approach to care. 
so that the uh, we're not passing along a patient from one specialist to another, we are converging so that there isn't a, a disconnect between the management of behavior and, and, and epilepsy and learning disability and so on. But I do think that the, the question uh, brings up a, a, a real problem that we have with this connect that comes from sort of intellectual silos. And I would link it also to a comment I'd like to just make about Connie's presentation, which I think we heard a fair amount in the, in the earlier presentations as well, to not be uh, yoked to a given level of investigation, that to be able to think in an integrative fashion across levels of investigation, to go from molecular to systems, to behavior, to systems of care, to be able to think along those axes, not just within a domain, I think is it's really important for making progress in a, a complex problem like autism and intellectual and developmental disabilities per se. Connie. Yes, I, I would certainly agree with that, Brad. Um, you know, one of the one of the, the the focus of our clinics at the institute, whether it's in our Center for Autism or in our Center for Synaptic Disorders, is to really have a multidisciplinary focus to care um, within our uh, synaptopathies uh, group. Our patients are seen on the same day by neurologists genetic counselor, behavioral psychologist, and neuropsychologist. And we sort of pull those together because we've seen that behavioral um, challenging phenotypes are present in that group of individuals. And so we wanted to have um, those rich dialogues so we can think about what medication are we using to manage their seizures and how might that impact their behavior or mood. And so when I, in caring for, for patients, I often think, you know, if I'm gonna give them a seizure um, medication, am I gonna use one that uh, can worsen their behaviors? So if they have behavioral phenotype, then I would uh, certainly uh, stay away from that. And if they have a behavioral phenotype, I would then think of an anticonvulsant uh, that has um, value in, in managing behaviors as well. So we, we I, I think it's uh, really critical that we think about the patient as a whole so um, they have behavioral, they have epilepsy, they have sleep, they have feeding, what else do they have? And how do we think about all of those systems and how they impact each other? So that is definitely the way forward. I guess the problem, I mean, most, although most places would in, in, agree with you about integrating, integrated medicine and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's um, I assume it's just more expensive and more difficult. I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, that is it. You run an institute that does this. I mean, it, it, it is. And um, I think it is an unusual circumstance um, that it, it's related to the, the way we, we basically structure our, our, our care and our, and our, our billing. But uh, thankfully, we. Um, are recognized as delivering, and so payers pay, pay and we're able to, um, to to basically take on a, a multidisciplinary approach across rare and common conditions. Um, and I, I think the the while it's, it seems to be expensive on the front end, in in the way that uh, Roger that you're suggesting, I think the yield it has it very likely has significant savings in the long haul, which is what we're shooting for. So uh, well, how do you see this field, this field developing? I mean, you're sitting right in the middle of it. You have tentacles everywhere. You can, you can direct, you, you can come up with a direction. What do you think are the, the most pressing issues that need to be dealt with at this point when considering social and medical aspects? So I think um, that certainly the, the medical aspects of autism are always front and center, right? So whether we have issues with sleep or we have issues with GI, um, those are going to impact behavior. So I'd like to put the medical piece in the center and then ask what else um, are some of the most challenging um, uh, features for the, the, 
parent and family to deal with? And what is the impact of those on the structure of the family or the stress that the parents are experiencing? And often in my experience, that is the behaviors. Right, and, and, and that, um, you know, outside of the, the medical piece, I think we need to get a handle on the maladaptive behaviors um, that uh, subsequently occur. So I can't quite tell from here whether we've got, uh, whether we've got people online. John Hickey, are you there? Yes, sir, I am here. Do you have any questions? We, we, I'm trying to engage more people. We, 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 we don't have access to as many. I mean, because you, you've talked to, to me a lot about uh, uh, the importance of, um, you know, in, in terms of your own son, the, uh, the use of gaming and stuff like that. I mean, uh, this is a completely new area, completely new field. But what I was trying to get at with, with, um, with, with, um, Brad here was that the, the the pandemic A and B social media seem to have changed possible um, methodologies and useful technologies in in quite extraordinary ways. And you, you've witnessed part of this, haven't you? Well, yeah, I've I've witnessed with my son, who's twenty two year twenty two year old, high functioning, that was a part of Dr. Leanne Klukowski's Pong studies um, from nine through 18. And then at 18, he asked Leanne if he could become part of her team. And he has done so for the last four years. And from his perspective, he really enjoyed being, in his words, going from a subject to uh, a part of the team and like looking at it from both sides as, you know, from the child aspect and then from the research side of it. And now he's on the design team with Leanne and and when I spoke with him, Roger and I spoke the other day about that, and I asked my son about his thoughts on socialization, yeah. and he said that the pandemic really helped him become more social because he and his circle of friends didn't have to travel, didn't have to worry about getting where they're going or any of the social uh, shortcomings that they may have. It was just hey, let's jump online and play a game and get to know each other. Yeah. So, I mean, given that sort of thing, where I was going with this was to come back to Brad and Connie and say, do you, do you see or do you already utilize this kind of um, technology that's become part of their lives within your treatment program? Do you, do you see a way of doing that where institutions do that sensibly? Rather than just... I it's a it's a it's a really provocative question. I do not <laughs> believe that I have a uh, I, I don't think that I've seen it uh, applied in a systematic fashion. I'm thinking right now about the dimensions of of severity and the heterogeneity of responses to life in the pandemic, for example. Uh, I mentioned uh, the schools that uh, the students that we have that come to our schools who really need significant behavioral supports. Uh, being uh, connected up uh, online uh, did not sufficiently address their needs. We saw regression. Yeah. Uh, we other students uh, because of the um, the decreased need for uh, a certain kind of social behavior uh, in, in a mainstream uh, uh, school, for example, less uh, manifestations of social anxiety thrive. As, as we were just hearing about thrive in, in yeah. the, this, this climate. So the heterogeneity um, and the spectrum of, uh, of significant, um, uh, the, the differences in the way people respond to, to, um, to those different settings, I think it's hard to come up with a general statement about the applicability of, of such approaches, but it, as part of an armamentarium, a set of tools, yeah, uh, I think it's it's a really interesting, yeah, provocative crazy. idea. You know, I ask crazy questions, but I was just, <laughs> just forgive me if, if, if it's just ludicrous. But whether one goes and what will you imagine somebody going at some point to the Kennedy Krieger Center and they the first thing is to say, OK, well, let's let's go to the gaming room and do some analysis here. I mean, is that out of the out of the. It's, it's not, and other gamification of other forms of, of uh, therapy, uh, we, we 
uh, used quite a bit. Um, thinking about Liz Torres's talk, uh, we see similar things in, in physical uh, rehabilitation using those tools. Uh, game, interaction, agency. Um, I, I think there's there's real value in exploring these these methods, but also understanding who those those approaches would benefit and and who would it would be a glancing blow. Yeah. And and one other question I have for for you is 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 about the um, whether you have a kind of a a therapeutic um, recipe for the way in which the science of autism conducts itself at this point. I mean, we've heard, so, I mean, we, we know that it's been pretty difficult at some point. In fact, even, even in the communication of science, you know, something that I do know something about, there's been this extraordinary shift. It began with that great thing, the public understanding of science, said the House of Lords in England. And what that basically meant was that the public was stupid, scientists were very smart, and we'll take a little bit of our time to explain what we do. And we hope you understand it. Well, that didn't work so well um, because it's kind of, we're not dumb. And that's why we now have this massive collection of populations of, uh, of communicators, people who all over the social media, LinkedIn, and so on masses more female scientists doing this sort of stuff and so on and so forth, which is great. Um, but the, the, the point is that it's not, uh, we will give a benediction of information to you. It's, can we talk to you? Can we discuss? We know a few things, that's certainly true. That's what we've got qualifications for, but we can learn along the way. I mean, that sounds to me like the kind of thing that you think now, even though you came out of a very rigorous sulk and otherwise background. <laughs> well, I, um, I can only agree, Roger. I, I think uh, this has been a journey. I mean, I'm, I would love to hear Connie's take on this uh, as well. We, we have similar roots, the, that kind of the traditional uh, upbringing uh, academically, but being in, now in a, uh, immersed in a setting that uh, really uh, takes seriously the, the collaborative relationship with uh, the, the, the people who, who we serve. Connie, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, that that therapeutic relationship or alliance is critical where we need to hear from parents in order to be able to be better informed in the decisions that we make for each patient. And we know that each patient is different. I mean, we have, we have said and we have heard time and time again, you see one individual who is autistic, you've only seen one and their needs are different. So to the question, is there um, any uh, clear directives as to what you will do for an individual with autism? I think that the, the clear directive in my mind is that it, it needs to be precise and tuned for that particular individual. Um, and it requires you know, interaction with the other uh, physicians and clinicians who are in, engaged in that child's care, but also with the family to support them in that regard. To the question of whether or not we um, can introduce uh, um, gaming technology or internet-based media to support uh, individuals with autism. I can see that working, even though it's not something we have done, but I can see that working certainly for individuals who are higher function, but I agree with Brad that it needs to be targeted based on um, the challenges of the individual. So for example, if we have a kiddo who loves to play video games and uh, uh, is hyper-focused on video games, um, an opportunity to uh, play video games for therapeutic uh, benefit might be more challenging than if we had someone who enjoys it, but is not hyper fixated on it. Um, so, you know, we, we will certainly need to think about the individual as we design the treatment approach. Yeah, I, I have a, a question for you, 
So it's actually from Doris Trauner, who's the next speaker. Um, uh, any potential for pharmacological intervention to reduce some of the problematic sensory issues? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and that's something that we have struggled um, with uh, in our in our clinic. How do we treat sensory uh, processing challenges? And to be honest, there is nothing that we are doing currently, so no current pharmacological agent that we have available to us that we have found to be beneficial. However, the the report from the David Ginty's group seems to be promising, and so. You know, we at this point in time, we won't be able to use that agent, but it might be an opportunity for us to begin to think, are there other similar agents that are either already available that could be used in select individuals who uh, their biology indicates that there is peripheral nervous system involvement. Um, so those are some of the things that I imagine will come down the pipeline, but um, not readily available at this time. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a question here also that uh, probably is a, one of our pretty much the last question. It's, it starts off, have you observed about, I think it means what have you observed about a, aversion to hearing speech in per, people with autism? Hmm. Hearing about? speech. So what I have noticed, so generally the individual will cover their ears to sound, but what I've noticed as it relates to speech is that often um, the child may begin to make noises or engage in disruptive behaviors when their parents are talking about them. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's speech in general, but when, this, when the conversation is about the child in the child's presence without engaging the child. And, and that's, that's what I've observed. Um, what motivates it? Not entirely sure. Um, but that's the extent of my observation as it relates to speech uh, in individuals with ASD. Yeah. How do you, I mean, how do you, how do you, what's your sense of how this entire situation, how it will look in, say, a 10 years? You know, I think um, we've certainly made a lot of progress over time, both uh, clinically in diagnosis and recognizing the spectrum and, you know, the phenotype in girls may be a little different from the phenotype in boys. Um, and there's been a lot of progress in uh, at the bench and in clinical research. I think what we need to do at this point in time is to integrate that information, but at the same time, sort of parse it, right? So um, we have identified many different genes that uh, play um, causal role or put individuals at risk for ASD and ASD-like phenotypes. So what are some of the similarities that we see in those uh, genetic disorders in terms of the, the molecular mechanisms, but also the clinical phenotype? And can we uh, use interventions, whether it's pharmacological interventions or behavioral interventions, so uh, across uh, a number of disorders, a number of genetic etiologies, as opposed to um, our being uh, primarily focused on treating one disease at a time. So I think in the coming years, it's, it's my hope, and one of the things that I'm uh, really interested in doing is to begin to ask, how can we leverage information from one disorder to other uh, genetic etiologies? And I imagine that um, that is something that we can look forward to um, in the uh, in the near future. Mm. So, I, I mean, it's really quite rapid recently what's been going on. I mean, as you showed in your slide there, the history of this, we go back to 1943, which isn't really all that long ago for Leo Kanner. And here we are with uh, all this extraordinary stuff going on. Have you, one final question, just to find out whether any of the same attitudes are applying here. The, the nature piece that I read out when Simon Baron Cohen was speaking this morning about his high profile autism genetics project caused amid backlash. Is there any, any of that kind of sens sensitivity in, in, in your daily dealings at Krieger? Oh, no, I have not experienced that. Um, but I, you know, one of the things that we have experienced is that there, there are uh, patients who are, or parents rather, 
who are motivated and desiring um, of uh, identifying a genetic cause. And that's often um, individuals who wanna know the why, right? And then there is a, a, a subcategory who, uh, depending on where they are in the diagnostic journey, so if their child is recently diagnosed, they're not really interested in the why at the moment because they wanna know how do I support my child in this moment in time? They are interested in things that will have immediate um, uh, uh, consequences of improving daily, daily function. And that's their primary focus. And then with time, they get to the place where they are more open to exploring the possibility that there might be a way to um, identify the why. So that's really been, been our experience here. Not a lot of pushback as it relates to uh, genetic testing. Okay. All right, well, it was great to hear from you both. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Great to see you.